named the world's 30th most powerful woman by Forbes magazine in 2011. She has served as vice chair of the World Economic Forum, as well as executive director of the United Nations World Food Program, or WFP, the world's largest humanitarian organization with 13,000 employees in over 70 countries, managing an annual budget of over $3 billion, one million alone earmarked for Asia. Confronting world hunger and promoting economic empowerment on a global scale is high on Sharan's agenda. The University of Colorado graduate was also U.S. Undersecretary of State for Economic, Business, and Agricultural Affairs. She is well-versed in high-level diplomacy on a global scale. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of Asia Society, Miss Josette Shiran. to be here in Manila during this APEC summit and already everyone is so impressed by the hospitality, warmth and efficiency of the welcome of the Philippines, so thank you very much. I'm also so excited to be here. This is the first time that the SME summit in APEC is brought right to the core. And I want to thank Doris Ho and the leaders of APEC for really making that happen. I think it's so important. Where better but in the Philippines, where 99% of businesses are small and medium enterprises, or micro enterprises. And where better than in the Philippines, where 65% of jobs come from SMEs. This is true throughout APEC, where you see from Vietnam to Malaysia to China, the SMEs really that engine of growth for not only APEC, but for the world. So one of the first things that I'd like to do in introducing the megatrends is give you a definition of a megatrend. So this is a profound and long-lasting social and economic change that is spurred by factors such as technology breakthroughs, shifts in geopolitical power, or in altering demographics. And so these are waves to be ridden, and hence this either to be swept away by or to be ridden. And so I think it's really appropriate that we identify a few of these big mega trends that are influencing the future of small and medium enterprises and of global business and progress. The first I'd like to talk about is the rise of connectivity. Let's just talk about the smartphone alone. It's the fastest selling gadget in all of human history. It's the core technology of the developing world. Half of the adults in the world today own a smartphone. And in the past four minutes since we started this session, 10,000 new smartphones have been shipped. This is a quote from 1899. This was the head of the Patent Office in the United States. And he said, you know, maybe we don't need to exist because everything that's going to ever be invented has already been invented. Do you think he was accurate? <laughs> Not quite. And I think what um, the world still does not foresee is that we're just at the beginning of the potential of connectivity to change our world. The next Alibabas, the next Ubers are being born right now today in the Philippines, in nations around the world, solving problems for everyday life. The head of Uber, the, the speaker for Uber, who you'll hear from today, was saying yesterday it was just the founder who just wanted to get easier rides in San Francisco. They weren't thinking of conquering the world. And so as we see connectivity changing the way we solve problems in the world, I think we're going to see from mobile money uh, to every sort of way that can enable and empower the poor and the developing world, you're going to see these ideas rolling through. Okay, there's the slide. So I just want to talk a little bit about this. This is actually a quote from myself. 
uh, in 2008 when the world food crisis hit. And I called it a silent tsunami because it was the first time in human history we had a globalized humanitarian disaster. Overnight, about 140 million new people were thrown into hunger. And you'd say, how? The whole world was saying, how could it be that something could spread like a virus from villages all over the world to the major countries with the price of food doubling overnight, it's seemingly. And actually, six months, the price of food doubled all over the world. And during that, I went around the world to figure out what happened. I went to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia into the food market there, which had no electricity. It was run mostly by donkeys. There were bags of food. And I asked one of the dealers who had doubled the price of his food. I said, how do you set your prices? And he said, it's very easy. He said, I go on the internet every morning. I look at the Chicago Board of Trade. I get the prices that are selling in Chicago. We're a poor country, so I discount them by 10% and I set my price. And I thought, wow, even pricing is now global. Even this is now connected. And so we could see all over the world this humanitarian crisis hit across the globe. What we're seeing at the base level are solutions that are spreading virally. And this one is in northern Cameroon. And in northern Cameroon, there was always cycles of hunger. The harvest would come, people would eat, and then they wouldn't be able to eat because the rains would come and there was no place to store food. And on this one, we had proposed putting in food banks where the whole village would put food after the harvest and then could eat all year. And um, the people of the village said, well, no one will trust each other. And if you ever have a problem, go to the women to find the solution. So we gathered the women of the village and we said, what can we do? We have the solution. It's affordable. It can happen. And they said, put three locks in the door and elect three people from the village to, but you can't unlock the, the grain bank unless you have the three keys. This three key solution has spread throughout Northern Cameroon to end cycles of hunger there. And there's a happy uh, filled grain bank. But I love these solutions that are growing up. This is Haiti during the earthquake in January 2010. I was there. There were two million people without food. I was living in a tent trying to run these operations. It was the first time I tweeted as a public official, and there weren't at that, in those days, 2010 isn't long ago, there were no public officials that I knew on Twitter. But my phone didn't work. And so I was sleeping and the ground was shaking all night. And then all of a sudden this rooster woke me up and I was so annoyed. And I said, dawn breaks over Port-au-Prince, the rooster crows. Doesn't he know what's happened here? And I just tweeted that and I wasn't really thinking about it. And by the time I got up, I had information from people who were trapped in buildings saying, we need help. We have an orphanage, the children aren't getting food. And I remember staring at my Blackberry then and saying, oh my goodness, technology can connect us in disasters. It can let people talk to people. We don't have to have official surveys and wait for things. We can get this information. And I remember then sitting in that broken, that's the presidential palace, by the way, in Port-au-Prince, thinking, I'm feeling the another world shake. And today, crisis mapping by citizens in the world is a very powerful force. In Kenya, a group named Ushaidi which means testimony in Swahili. If you go and you look them up, you'll be so inspired. It was young people with nothing started to create a map where people who were victims of violence could register. And this created a public testimony to what was happening to them. This technology now has gone global. And so when the earthquake hit in Kathmandu in Nepal just a few months ago, they use that same mapping capacity for hospitals and schools to register the amount of damage and where people could go to get help. 
And so I love the fact that Nepal learned from Nairobi. It doesn't all go back to Silicon Valley. It doesn't all go back to these big centers of technology now. And in fact, I see the leaders of technology, the US being wowed by what's happening out there in the front lines of the world. I want to talk now about another mega trend that I call the rise of self-empowerment. And in fact, in 1982, the originator of the, of the mega trends book, a very famous man, identified self-help as a new mega trend. That people could now do research on their own, diagnose themselves, try to manage their illnesses. They could do their own research. The internet wasn't quite accessible then. But this is way beyond that. This is individuals saying, I'm gonna take matters in my own hand. This is the disappearance of gatekeepers, the disappearance of barriers to entry. And so you see individuals taking on problems that everyone said, oh, it can't be easier. You can't fill out a government form easier. You can't solve this problem easy. And individuals saying, oh yes, you can. And they're starting to teach government and power structures what can happen. It's also driven by discontent. As everyone has access to the internet, maybe they were told for many years, you know, this, this is the way it is. And they go on the internet that they're like, this is not the way it is, or this isn't the way it could be. And so that discontent, you see people taking hold and creating new solutions that fit the local situation, and so that rise of self-empowerment. I just want to talk about a few amazing individuals here, and what strikes me in these examples is that these young people are really young. So this young man, when he was 15, someone in his family got pancreatic cancer and died, and he was very upset to learn there wasn't a diagnostic test. So at 15, he created one. He's like, what the heck? I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this, and this is now under patent. He's at Stanford University, or patent pending, and it's, it's something like 400 times better than anything that existed before as a test. His name is Jack Andronka. I wanna talk about the lucky iron fish here. This was a young student in Canada who said, so many women in the world are dying from anemia. And so many kids in childbirth are dying from anemia. He came to see me at the World Food Program. He said, I want to end anemia. I said, I'm used to young people coming and saying, I'm going to solve this big problem. And I said, well, there's only thousands of people trying to solve this problem. It's very expensive, very hard to deal with. The, the pills that you can get through the United Nations cost something like $90 per person. So he figured out that if you created this little iron fish and put it in a rice pot, it gives exactly the right amount of iron for a family. And it ends the epidemic of anemia. It costs $5, it lasts five years. And after five years, a little smile disappears. This is now in 66 countries. And so the lucky iron fish, if you go online, you'll see about this. And the last one I wanna talk about actually is powered up here in the Philippines. These are called leaders of light. And what the woman in her home is looking at is a plastic bottle. A man named Ilac Diaz has helped spread this uh, throughout the world. And um, it's a discarded soda bottle with some bleach in it and some water. And it takes the sunlight and refracts it. It has no zero carbon footprint. It recycles, it's kind of a win, 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 win technology, and they hope by the end of this year to have reached a million homes with it. So these stories really inspire me. Doris wants us to be inspired today, but the, what this tells me is that individuals can now really be a force, not just locally as they always could in human history, and not just if they're big, but even at small scale, can create things that inspire the world. I just have to touch on the rise of cities here because this is a true phenomenon, a true megatrend. Um, there's some implications that are very important. 
But what we know is that um, between 2010 and 2025, 440 cities in the world will generate half of global GDP growth. And most of these are cities, or many of them, that most people have not heard of. Who's heard of Surat, Foshan, Puerto Alagro? So these um, cities were seeing the emergence of these powerful new forces. In fact, in 2014, A.T. Kearney did a study of the next global cities and centers of innovation in the world, the top 10, are Nairobi, Mumbai, Bogota, New Delhi, Addis Ababa. The number one, they predict, is Jakarta. Guess what number two is? Manila. Manila's predicted to be the next great global city and center of innovation. I don't know what's happening here, but it's very exciting, and the world is paying attention, but what that means is that opportunity is coming in a way that one could not have felt or predicted in the past. And Manila's ability to change the way the world does business through its own examples and dealing with its own challenges. That's the power of cities. Um, I talked about this, but I just want to talk about this. There are other problems. In the next 40 years, the world has to produce more food just to keep up with predicted population growth than in the last 8,000 years combined. We have to be careful to ensure that farming and rural life is attractive to the next generation. And so I only say that, I don't know how many of you have seen the, the farm selfies of young people around the world they're called Felfies. So on their farms, sending out their selfies on Twitter, look at them, they're amazing, but there's a band of young people who are saying, we're gonna stay and we're gonna help take care of this challenge for the world and we need to encourage them. And the last trend, mega trend I wanna talk about is the rise of Asia. So in 1960, when Asia Society was started by John D. Rockefeller III, Rockefellers have always cared deeply about Asia. The first contribution a Rockefeller made to Asia was in 1864. He was a very poor man, and he would send half of his salary to help poor kids in China. And even in, in 1960, um, and even later, Asia accounted for uh, most of the global poor and hungry, and really was viewed as a place of great poverty and conflict. Of course, we're seeing you know, a very different finite, story so now. Sacrificing. Is that Asia rising? <laughs> I'm feeling it. Um, and so, today, Asia accounts for 42% of global R&D, half the world's economic output, and by 2030, Asia will overtake Europe and North America in combined global power based on GDP, population, military spending, and technological investment. So instead of being, as it was in 1990, half of the global poor, now 12% of the global poor. In fact, Asia has lifted more people out of poverty in the past three decades than all of human history combined. I want to talk about this because the world does not yet fully see the brilliance of Asia. So even though we see so much of R&D coming from Asia, we see lagging. There's many indicators like this. Um, and so our challenge at Asia Society, we've created the Asia Global Game Changers Awards at the United Nations to recognize the emerging brilliance of Asia so the world can pay attention. You two are, you are all here sitting at the beginning of what is really the biggest mega trend that I think will define our next decades, which is Asia's coming onto the global scene and really helping us all to end poverty 
for the world. The United Nations has set new goals. The world came together by 2013. The goal is now set to eradicate poverty, extreme poverty, by 2030. Not cut it in half, not cut it by 10%, but to eradicate it. And I truly believe that's in our reach. And so while we see technology being used for truly evil purposes, such as the spread of ISIS or the attacks that we saw in Paris, and I know we all stand with the people of Paris, we also see the potential for technology to transform our world and for each of you to play your part in creating a world with peace and prosperity and using technology to power up human hope and ambition. Thank you.